this case, yeah, Brene Brown is awesome. I love her because of the work that she's done. Absolutely. All right, so back to step number one. When you recognize that your amygdala is activated, deep breathing really is going to be your best bet. Now, if you can, I mean, in like certain work situations and whatnot, taking a break um, may not always be possible. And that that can be very frustrating. Um, if you're in a relationship and, and it's, you know, I'm feeling flooded is what the Gottmans call it. So John and Julie Gottman call this amygdala response or this brain hijacking as being emotionally flooded. And their first recommendation in couples is to allow the partners to take at least a 20 minute break and then come back um, to the argument um, later when you're when you're calmed down. And um, so, but either way, the goal is to breathe because as you deep breathe, so we're talking about slow, measured, deep breathing with no pauses. And we're going to explain why we want no pauses here in a minute. And Faye, I saw your comment, but I didn't. Yeah, Alex, can we put that one back can up Can you there? put that one back up? Yeah, and leave Sarah it. Sarah couldn't pause at the moment. If yeah, you, I want to. If wanna... you pause her in the middle, you might not ever get the rest back. <laughs> right. So just hold that comment there. I'm going to come right to you, Faye. I see that. Thank you for joining us. Let me finish this thought and then I'm going to respond to this. So yeah, taking that break in breathing. And the reason is because as you slow down your breathing and you have an inhalation and an exhalation with no pause, because when you hold your breath while in an emotionally activated or an amygdala activated brain space, what's going to happen is your amygdala is going to go, blah, you're holding your breath, freak out. And you're gonna, it's going to take longer to calm that down. And so instead, we want you to inhale and exhale slow, measured. You can count it if you want to. I'm a big inhale for two, exhale for four. We called that a deep breath with prolonged exhalation, whatever works for you, as long as you're not pausing. So like yoga breathing or box breathing, where they say inhale for two, hold for two, exhale for two, hold for two. Great way to breathe, but not when you're emotionally flooded because holding that breath is going to cause you to panic. We also know that in about two to three minutes of breathing in this slower measured way, your, um, amygdala, you're going to have that switch back. It is more effective. And this can be found in the book. Um, oh goodness. What is it called? The rewire your anxious brain. It's on our recommended reading list. I don't have that ready to go for the show today, but we'll put that in the show notes where two to three minutes of this breathing is actually more effective than a benzodiazepine is in 20 minutes. Um, the challenge is that most people will terminate that deep breathing before they get to that two to three minute mark because the amygdala resists. At about the one minute mark, you're actually going to feel a little bit more anxious because the amygdala is like, no, 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 no. You're not going to stop. I've got things here that you need to pay attention to. So you have to breathe through that one minute to one and a half minute resistance to get to the other side of it where you will then feel that sense of calm. But that is always going to be your step number one is to focus on your breathing. All right. So Faye says we can grow in moments when we can sit with the urge to chase that next sensation. Our moment grows. Our power. Our power grows each time we sit with the urge and watch it with compassion. Practice indeed. Yes, Faye. I love that. Um, In my field, we call that leaning in. And we're going to talk about that. So Alex, if you can pull up the rage sheet, we're going to talk about what to do. Step number two. So for my clients that are saying, Sarah, how to, how do we do this? What are the steps? These are the steps. So number one, breathe. That purple behind that orange reminds me of the Phoenix Suns. That's a very, yeah, Mason says yay. And I say, go Arizona, go Arizona. We're both from Arizona but we don't live there anymore. Alrighty. So step number one, breathe. Step number two is going to be very similar. Um, Alex, can you pull up the boring ruler one? That's what I'm going to start calling it. The boring ruler one. Yeah. So as you can see here, their number one and my number one are the same, but I actually combine them. So their rule number one is recognize and then label. I put that under the R recognize, if you go back to the RAID worksheet, you're going to see recognize what you are feeling 
and name it. You're also going to recognize where in the body am I feeling it? So for Sarah Westbrook, anger feels hot in my chest, tighten my shoulders. I tend to clench my jaw. I tend to clench my fists. I'll grind my teeth. I get tension headaches if I'm not doing something with it. But being able to identify anger for me feels like this helps my brain recognize it faster. Hey, you're angry when you're in that amygdala brain space. So I want you to recognize what you're feeling. Give it a name. Be specific in that name. And we'll talk about why being specific is so important um, here in a minute. And then where in the body do I feel it? What does it feel like? And that information comes in really handy later on. The next piece is to accept it. And when I talk about acceptance, I mean radical acceptance. I don't have to understand what the emotion means for me. I don't need to understand what I'm going to do with this emotion. I don't need to understand why I'm feeling. I don't need to understand it yet at all. But just to say, huh, I'm angry. That's okay. People get angry. If it's from a trigger and you can identify that trigger saying, you know what, Mason, you just kicked me in the shins and that pissed me the F off. Sorry, Sarah drops the F bomb. I'll try not to on these live shows. Try. I will try. But you just kicked me in the shins. I'm feeling really betrayed and angry about that betrayal. That makes sense to me. That's normal. Humans do that. That's where we get into beginning to identify the emotion that is coming because of the trigger. Because once again, the old way of thinking was that our frontal cortex was um, firing first and that we always had a thought following, I'm sorry, that the thought came first and the emotion came second. And that's bullshit. The emotion comes whenever the emotion comes. It can come first, come second, come fifth. It can come. I mean, emotions just come because again, that survival instinct responds first by the emotion and then the action. And the thought isn't always there. Like if I see a bear, I'm not going to think that's a bear. I got to run. My body's going to jump into action and I'm going to be running and being like, whoa, where the heck did this bear come from at the same time? So that whole idea that thought always comes before action is is inaccurate in my opinion. Well, and I, I think that uh, I'm going to go right back to the word that I used before. If if you can't accept the emotion, then there's a lot of judgment that gets involved. And why that really becomes a problem is because it's hard to move into the next one, which is to investigate what's going on. Yeah. If now you're coming from a, a place of guilt or a place of shame, or like, oh, I can't believe I am feeling this. I shouldn't be feeling this. Um, I think that's that's why the judgment is so big of a deal because now when I move into investigation, I'm judging myself and I'm in a completely different um, place. Instead of going, okay, this is what I felt. All right, I can accept that. I felt that. Mm-hmm. It makes sense that I feel that. And this is okay. Then right. you can investigate and go into that and all that stuff. Well, so. and sometimes it's even shorter than that. Sometimes it can be, I'm feeling really sad and I don't know where this is coming from, but that's okay. My body's trying to tell me something and I don't need to understand it right now. And then we breathe through it. So yeah. Tanya, you ask a really great question. How do you find... How do you define the emotions you're feeling, especially when they're all tangled? This is where getting specific gets really helpful. Um, And in, in the sense of it is normal for us to feel more than one emotion at a time. That happens all the time. And so really what happens is once you get back into that logical brain space, you can then begin to build kind of like an emotional tree and understand where things are connected. Um, but we're not at that place yet. So I'm going to come back to that. Mason, please remind me to come back to that. Or Alex, if I forget, like shoot me a message and say, Hey, Sarah, come back to what do I do when I've got, right. How do I untangle my emotions? Cause I think that's a great question. So as Mason said, as we practice radical acceptance of, I feel this, I don't necessarily know why. And that's okay. I'm human. Sometimes humans feel this. Um, And also normalizing it along the lines of I'm not the only one who feels this way. I'm not the only one this happens to can be a very good thing. 
the I in whatever, raid. Whatever it takes, basically. Whatever right. it takes for you to get to the point where you're telling yourself, I'm okay. It's okay that I'm feeling this. Well, and sometimes that's hard because if you grew up in a home like most of us have where it's stop crying, you're acting like a baby, we don't want to express our emotions. And usually the reason we were told that was because the external source, our parent, our teacher, our caregiver, a sibling, whoever that might be was uncomfortable with our emotional response. They didn't know what to do with it. So we learned to be uncomfortable with the emotional response. Right, because they shut us down. And so we're like, ooh, that's bad. I'm doing something bad. And and you're not. This is normal. So that I is get curious. And we do that by asking ourselves what and how questions. What am I feeling? Um, How is this affecting me? What's going on for me? We really want to avoid those why questions. I don't know why this is. Other than to say that when we ask ourselves why, our defense mechanism in the brain goes off and it stops curiosity. The curiosity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's because I didn't say the Freudian, F word earlier. Freudian That's a Freudian slip. Freudian slip. Curiosity. You've mentioned a few times that the why question tends to cause us to be judgmental of right. whatever it is that we're asking for and why that is. Who the heck knows? Right. But recognizing that it is and learning to switch, because it's not going to be that way all the time. Sometimes you're going to ask yourself a why question. You're completely curious. But if you can learn to recognize that what's going on in your brain when you do that, you'll be able to avoid some pitfalls in the future. Well, and you can utilize this skill with your kids. You know, instead of why are you getting a snack in the middle of the night, if you ask them how come you're up right now, then they're more likely to feel comfortable in, oh, well, I woke up from a bad dream and recognized I was hungry, so I came upstairs to get a snack. So even with other people, if you're coming at them, you know, Mason, why are you putting your hand on your leg like that right now? That amygdala is like, oh, I feel judged. And so by taking away that word why, by navigating around it, yes, it takes a little more mental effort to do, but it also helps to keep that, um, what is that, what, what, my brain just went blank there. Um, oh, when we, when we take the extra effort on that front end, it usually means less effort on the back end. Yeah. So then this last one on the raid, okay, let's see. We can... Hey, hey, I like that idea. Alex just gave us a great idea. At the end, we'll wrap up and and address some of the questions that don't come up here. So, So fantastic idea. All right, so we've got this D, this discharge. And this one is my favorite. This is one of my favorite stories to tell in session. And this is bringing us full circle adult tantrums. Um, Emily and Amelia Nagoski talk about the need to discharge. And the, the thought in my field, especially, and in the medical field, is we do this through movement. We do this through exercise. You can do this through a calming movement, through like yoga or stretching or meditation. It doesn't, you know, depending on what works for you. I know that when I'm sad and I cry, I don't want to go out and move until after I've had some time to hold still and... Um, I can, oh, no, I I can hear your water <laughs> glugging in the no, microphone. Mason needs to pee. Just kidding. I'm all right. He heard the water fall. You are awesome. That was for all the people out there judging me for having a coffee mug. It's just full of water. You are awesome. Keep that shit up. <laughs> Don't spit your water out. <laughs> mine, mine says, squirrel, mine says, of course I talk to it. There we go. Of course I talk to myself. Sometimes I need expert advice. <laughs> I am a little narcissistic. Okay, so um, anyway, this discharge is, is this adult tantrum. So the thought, the medical thought is movement. And that is absolutely true. Because as we move our bodies, our bodies are able to metabolize the cortisol and the adrenaline that comes from the stress response or that is generated from the energy of feeling emotion. So kind of like when you fill your car up with gas, when you have an emotional response, it's kind of like somebody accelerated the um, the gas pedal and we've got to do something with that excess gas that's coming through our body or this excess energy that's coming through our body. And so some type of exercise can be very helpful. So when I said earlier, you know, it's really important for us to identify where in the body we feel this, that's because if I feel my tension or my anger in my biceps, 
which I do, if I access movement that utilizes that muscle group that has become tight, then I have a better, I have be- a, the, blah, 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 my ability to discharge that emotional response and complete the emotional cycle is enhanced. And so I do this through my tantrum tree. And, and I'm not even kidding, y'all. When I talk about having a tantrum tree, I'm being very, very serious. So around the time that I determined that I could no longer have contact with my family um, because it had become too toxic, um, my I'll just go ahead and tell the story. My autistic daughter um, was having a mental breakdown in the back of my car because over cereal, I believe is what it was, breakfast cereal, because we didn't have time or something. I don't remember. It was in the morning. Um, and she leapt from my moving vehicle. And gratefully, I had gotten the car slowed down and pulled over. So when she leapt from the moving vehicle, I was going less than five miles an hour. She got some scrapes on her face, a little bit of a black eye and whatnot. And I had to take her um, to the emergency room. She was, you know, we transported her to the emergency room safely. Um, and she, you know, got screened in the emergency room. We, we, we went to the pediatric hospital. Gratefully, she had no injuries from jumping from the vehicle. Gratefully, she had done this enough times or, or attempted to do this on the school right, bus and to. whatnot. The, yeah. the, the, the investigation piece of, uh, why is your daughter jumping out of your moving vehicle was really easy on us. But when we went to the hospital, they, of course, chose she needed to be admitted. And I agreed 100%. She needed to be admitted to an inpatient psych unit because her flight response, her getaway response to exit the vehicle when it was obviously not safe, that's that logical reasoning gone, amygdala, her flight response, get out, get away in full force. In fact, she stood up from the ground when she exited the vehicle and she put her hands on her hips and she looked right at me and she goes, mom, why didn't you tell me this was going to hurt? And I'm like, uh, literally I was like adrenaline going crazy, but I had reached out to my family and said, Hey, I need some help. I need, cause Mason, you were on call. Um, and you know, it was a holiday weekend. It was mother's day, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I need some help. And my family did not come. They, they claimed that I was exaggerating, um, that I was overreacting and whatnot. And I was like, all right, this has gotten really toxic. And later we did counseling to try and reconcile some of the issues and it just got worse and worse and worse. And so we determined that there would be no more contact. Um, at that time I was angry y'all. I was really angry that my family let us down in that way. And that's not the first time that this has happened. Like we're talking about lots of things that have built up. This was just kind of like that really big straw. This was the boulder that finally broke the camel's back. And I said, okay, we need help. And when help didn't work, I said, I'm out. I'm done. But there was a lot well, of anger for it, me. It wasn't so much that they were unable to help. It was that they chose not to. Right. Yeah. It was not an... Like, we get it. If you, it was, if, you right. can't, if you can't come, you can't come. I was on call. I can't, you know, right. I can't be there. My dad was literally, who's from Arizona, was literally three less than three hours away from us. He was in St. Louis on that weekend and refused to come get our kids out of school and, and what I was, it was a mess. So yes, it was not an inability to come. It was an unwillingness to come. Right. So anyway, obviously I was very, very angry. And so I sat up in the hospital and at the first chance I got where I was able to leave the emergency room, uh, Mason, your niece came out and helped us out instead of my family coming, um, which was, just y'all, if you know this niece of mine, and I won't name her because I don't know how comfortable she is with that, but she is an angel from heaven. Absolutely love this girl. Um, but she came and helped take care of Abby so I could come home and help take care of the little kids while you were, on, you know, the other kids at home while you were on call um, and whatnot. And I had that pent up anger, like it was coursing through my veins for a couple of days. 
and I could not discharge it because I was sitting in a hospital room. So I was doing my deep breathing skills. I had run the the R, the A, the I. I knew what was making me angry. I knew it was okay. I had vented. I had, you know, called Mason and vented to you. I called some other good friends and vented to them. Like I was running my process, but I was not getting rid of that anger. My body was holding on to it. And that mind-body connection is well documented in the medical literature. Um, and again, exercise and movement is thought to be the best way to discharge it. And sometimes I'm here to say, if there's a lot of going on anger, like there was for me, just going for a run isn't enough. And so I have this tantrum tree and I took it, a nativity that I was going to give my mom. My mom collects nativities. I had not given it to her yet. So she didn't know about it. It had no emotional meaning to anybody. And I took it out to the tantrum tree and I stuck it on a bench and I took a baseball bat overhead and I smashed the shit out of that thing. Now, why did I need to do this? Remember, Sarah Westbrook holds her tension in her chest and her biceps. Number two, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not hurting my kids. I was really good. I didn't snap at the kids. I didn't snap at Mason. I, you know, I just, I actually did not snap at my mom. I don't think at that point. No, yes, I did. Ha, I lied. I sent her a nasty gram text message. It was not the best, but not, not my most shining moment. Thank you, Amygdala. I let me own that there. But what happened for me is as I was able to utilize my biceps and my upper body to bring that back down on that glass and hear it shatter outside. We have acreage. So, you know, our neighbors weren't looking at us funny. Gail, if you're listening, I love you. I promise we're normal human beings. Um, but anyway, I threw, <laughs> maybe we're not so normal. Shout out to Pencil to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Woo-hoo. Been excited, been there. It's an exciting city, and we're thrilled that we have listeners there. Thank you for joining the podcast and listening to what we have to say. Yeah, our twins were born in Philadelphia. Philly. Yeah. yeah, and when we when we went to meet them, so adopted twins were born there. And when we went to go meet them, we took our kids to the Liberty Bell. Um, yeah. To all the all the good yeah, sites. Yeah, we went. Well, we went and did not the, all the good sites. <laughs> but we, we went, took them to we a few. We went and did and some was, of the historical stuff. It's a beautiful city. I love the history, so it was really fun for yes. us to be there. Yes, absolutely. Thanks Welcome. Thanks for listening, guys.